All right, well, Pastor Danny's got this timer ticking away. It's making me nervous up here. So I use timers all the time at school. I've got like four or five of them, and we burn through them. Uh, okay, why don't we go ahead and pray again. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for just the honor we have to serve you, to love you. Lord, to be your children and to be called out of a world of darkness into your heavenly, truthful, glorious light and the kingdom of your Son. Lord, help us today to just draw near and fill us with your spirit, fill us with your word. In Jesus' name, we all can say, Amen? All right, well, turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to John chapter 1. And I know we're going to be doing Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 6. I will tell you right now, I will try to get through all of the entire chapter. But um, as I was doing my notes, we've got a lot of different places we may or may not go. And, and this one was not on my list. I'm just going to start with this because I, I think it's a good overview of where we'll, what we'll be talking about today. So John chapter 1, verses you might be very familiar with. And it says this in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 2 says, The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, meaning Jesus, the Word. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Verse 4 says, And in him, in Christ, was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness comprehends it not. And some versions may say the darkness does not overcome it. And that's really, when I was going through 1 Timothy, and we will read 1 Timothy chapter 6, but I wanted to say a couple things about this section. When I was going through 1 Timothy chapter 6, it is rich with text. And so I was praying about how to tie it together. And I really do think it does tie together really well with the rest of the chapter. So to start this, I'm going to ask you guys a question. Do you remember what you wanted to be when you were little? And the kindergarten teacher at my school, I teach up in, in Surprise at a Christian school called Cross Christian Academy. Um, oh, by the way, a little plug. I also work with uh, Kyle Peart and we do, and, and Eli Peart, and we do a ministry by God's grace called Once Lost Ministries. Does a lot of outreach, evangelism, and apologetics. And I gave Pastor Danny some of our tracks. We just do gospel tracks for free. Thought I would bring some with me. We also have Kyle put together some nice little business cards that have like a QR code on the back, and it, it gets you to our website and it gets you to the YouTube page. So if you want to look at some of the stuff we've talked about, we just did a talk on what do you do with people who live on an island somewhere when you're, you know, can God reach those people? And we just did like a 45 minute discussion on YouTube last week and posted that. We've done discussions on Calvinism and we're going to be doing one on, on Catholicism coming up here shortly. So if you want to check any of it out or if you just want some free resources some free tracks to hand out to people and bless them, um, they're going to be out in the foyer and they, and they are literally free. All of it's free. So just uh, letting you know that more than anything else. But when you're, you know, when you're little and you have these ideas of what you want to do when, you know, when you grow up. And the kindergarten teacher every year videos her class saying what they want to be. And almost always it's like a handful of the same thing, right? I want to be a doctor. I want to be a nurse. I want to be a teacher. I want to be an astronaut, a firefighter, maybe uh, a lot of people, the best, you know, I want to be a veterinarian when I grow up. I want to be an architect. I want to be a mom. It's a great one. We hear that once in a while. And I was thinking, you know, the one thing I don't think I've ever heard as I was putting this message together and I was, I was thinking about, like, what have I never heard? One thing I don't think I've ever heard a kid say and I've never thought of is I want to be a good servant. <coughs> never heard that. Maybe it's just the world we live in. Maybe it's our country because, you know, we're not really taught to serve. And it's not really a job, so, you know, kids don't really think of it as a job. But I don't think I've ever heard a kid say, I want to be a better servant as a, as, a, as a profession. But I think sometimes as Christians we forget that that really is a huge profession for us, no matter what we do, whether we're a mom, whether we're a nurse, whether we're a veterinarian, whatever it is, we're a servant. And that really is what is going to tie together, I think, 1 Timothy chapter 6. So a couple other things I was thinking before we get started is, 
when you're born, right, because, you know, when you're little, you think about all these different things. What do you want to do when you grow up? What kind of family do you want? What kind of dog do you want? Maybe, I don't know, all the different things we think about. But when you're born on this planet, are you born with God or away from him? You can interact here. Are you born with God or are you born away from him? You're born actually away from him. See, when Adam and Eve sinned, of course, we're separated from God. So when children are born, you know, they haven't yet sinned, but they're born in a separated state, spiritually. And so the Bible calls that dead. Not like dead like I can't do anything, but dead like separated. And so when we're born, we're born separated from God, and we live in a world constructed in a way that is trying to form ideas separated from God. We all know these kind of ideas, right? One of the, one of the popular ones today I hear it a lot is, well, you have your truth and I have my truth. You ever heard that one before? That's an idea from somebody who, from a world, a philosophy system that is separated from God. And when we're born, that's the system we're born into, this system of I got to get it all for myself. I have to love myself more. I need to put me first, follow my feelings, whatever I believe, that's, you know, that's the truth of the matter. And we're in a, we're in a culture now that actually goes, it used to be whatever you feel, go ahead and believe it. Your feelings dictate, you know. And then it was, you know, whatever you feel, go ahead and do it. And now we're in a culture that actually says, whatever you feel, that's who you are. And it can be fluid. It can move from moment to moment. So if at this moment I feel like a cat, I'm actually a cat. If it, next moment, and not making a joke, that's really what people think. And so if I feel in a couple moments like a guy, then I'm a guy. And then, I, and then it, it fluidly flows into whatever I feel at that moment. So it's no longer just whatever I feel, believe it. Whatever I feel, do it. Now it's gone to the very being, the very core of who I am. Whatever I feel, that's who I am. And I think that's a lie from, from Satan. And what he's tried to do is get our eyes so far off the true light of the world and just get it on darkness as much as he can. And that's really the battle that we are in. When we're born in this world, you probably, we don't realize it, but we're born into a battle. Now Jesus has already victoriously won that battle on the cross. But we fight it, in a sense, from victory every day. And that's the world we live in. The world will say to you, hey, we have a way that leads to life, and you have to go through our truth, our mantras, our philosophies. Now, they're not really true, but that's what they'll say. They are kind of true, but there is no truth. But their truth is truth, but there is really no truth. That's absolute. And that's what they'll say. That's the world that we are born into. That's the philosophy of this world, which really doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and I'm glad that we don't function that way. Like, if I go on an airplane, I'm glad that the pilot probably doesn't really think that. Otherwise, he'd be pushing buttons, or she'd be pushing buttons that, you know, whatever, I feel like pushing this button right now. I feel like pushing that button. I'm glad that we don't actually function that way in reality. But the sad thing is we function that way spiritually, which means that we're only going to get more separated from the God that created us. And that's what Satan wants to keep us from is that victorious life in Christ. And even as Christians, as born-again believers, we can be infected with those ideas. And if you think about it, right, the world has its philosophy. If you can get to its life, which is really death, but you have to go their way and you have to go through their philosophies or their truth. And I was thinking the other day, I was thinking when Kyle and I were talking, I was down last weekend and we were coming up with some ideas for some t-shirts. And I said, you know, it's funny. I have my truth and you have your truth. That's what the world says. But you know who never gets to be the truth? God. When people say that, they'll say, well, you have your truth and I have my truth. And, I, and I, next time somebody says that to me, I really want to say to them, but doesn't God get to have his truth? Like he's the only one who doesn't get to have the truth. You know what I mean? He's left out because that's really not the point. The system that we're born into is a godless in one sense, but many gods in another sense. Godless meaning not the true God, but filled with gods, eight, eight billion of them almost now, right? We're born in a pantheistic society that's also polytheistic. It's all mixed together, and that's the world we live in. I mean, when you walk out these doors, we're going to walk into a world that is filled with darkness, and we have to understand the truth. Jesus said, if you stay in my word, you will know the truth in John 8, 31 and 32. Not part of the truth. Not the truth plus whatever the world says or whatever you feel or whatever I feel, but you will know the truth. It's funny how the Lord, uh, you know, the Lord tells us that his word is what sanctifies us. 
Jesus prayed in John 17, sanctify them by your word, your word is truth. And sometimes my flesh wants me distracted from the word. I've talked to several people over the last couple weeks, few weeks, and every one of them that's excited lately about the Lord says, I'm starting to read my Bible again. And that's really where it's at. It really is the simple things in life. Well, Jesus has his truth, and Jesus has a way that leads to his life. And I always say it this way, you know, John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Not me, but him, of course. And I always say it this way. I'll say, if you want true life, you have to go through the truth or the way of the truth. So if you want the way to life, you have to go through truth. I think God didn't accidentally put the truth right in the middle of everything. And Jesus really does want us free and victorious in our lives. So with that in mind, with that in mind of this dichotomy, these two world systems, you know, the world will say to you, love yourself more. Jesus says, take up your cross. In other words, crucify the flesh and follow me. The world will say, follow your feelings. Jesus will say, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? The world will say that God is just a judgmental ogre in heaven. And Jesus says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Right? The world will say that some people are better than others. And Jesus says, we're all equal at the foot of the cross. We're all sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We're all equal. We're in the same boat. So there are these two competing systems. One system is called darkness, according to the Bible. The other system is called the light. Sometimes he calls it the life and death, right, in Joshua. God says, I said two things before you, life and death, choose life. Sometimes those systems are called other things, and we have a God of this world, Satan, and we have the God of the, above the universe, the true and living God. And that's what hopefully we can focus on for the remaining time. So turn with me to Colossians as we're moving our way closer to 1 Timothy with these ideas in mind. The idea of, of servanthood at the center is really where I think we need to be. And so if you turn with me to Colossians, which is about, I don't know, five or six books over, you have 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and then Colossians. This is one of my favorite books in the Bible. It took us a while to get through this when I was teaching down in Tucson. But Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, and I'm going to read a few verses, and you're going to notice some things that I'm not going to try to point too, point too much out, otherwise we'll end up uh, just being stuck here. But Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, it says this, We give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hang on to that word, thanks. Praying, sorry, I got the pop. Praying, I'm not going to do it every time. Praying always for you since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love which you have to all the saints. Verse 5 says this For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Now, do you see the dichotomy there? You have a worldly system, but he's pointing you to a hope that's in heaven, not a hope that's in this earth. There's a system that he's saying, Look above, not below. So he's saying in verse 5 again, For the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, whereof you heard before in the word of the truth, there's the truth of the gospel. Verse 6, Which is come unto you, and as, is, as it is in all the world, and brings forth fruit, as it does also in you, since the day you heard of it, and knew the grace of God in truth. Verse 7 says, As you also learned of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, there's the servanthood, who is for you a faithful minister of Christ, who also declared unto us your love in the Spirit. For this cause we also, since the day we heard of it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing and being fruitful unto every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. This is a mouthful. I'm, I want to just go a couple more verses. Verse 11, it says, Strengthened, talking about the believers, strengthened with all might, that means God's might, according to his glorious power, and unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. Giving thanks, there's thanks again, unto the Father which has made us meet or ready to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Verse 13, who has delivered us from the power of what? What does it say there? The power of, 
the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom <clears throat> excuse me the kingdom of his dear son in whom we have redemption through his blood even the forgiveness of sins now it goes on and talks about i would love if we had more time to go, to read that but you get this you get this progression of thankfulness leading to servanthood leading to the glory of god it just seems like there's this nice progression as we're reading how we grow in service but we grow in wisdom and we grow in knowledge of who Jesus really is. And then we have it from his glorious power. And so I think of it like this. I think the world is going to tell me I need to grow in its wisdom. I need to grow in its ways so that I can receive real power, so I can be great, right? And Jesus says, mm -mm. there's another system at play here. When you're born again, you're translated from that kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his marvelous son, his dear son. And then you have this new life that says freedom is found in serving. Freedom is found in loving each other. Freedom is found in knowing Jesus. It's not found in how much money you have in your bank account. It's not found in the most powerful job or the job you've been dreaming of ever since you were five years old. It's not found in your plans. And it's not found in my plans. Freedom isn't found in what I want. Right? That's really why most people get divorced, because they don't get what they want. They're looking at the other to serve them, but not how can I serve the other. That's just how it is. And as kids, you know, we struggle with that. We grow up and then we get to those teenage years when we <clears throat> excuse me, start feeling independent. And I remind my students who are fourth and fifth graders, you'll never be independent from some things. Never be independent from air. Never be independent from gravity, at least on this planet. You'd never be independent from food. You'll never be independent from certain physical things. And I think God did that on purpose to remind us you'll never be independent from him. God isn't your genie. He's not here to make you great. He's here so we can finally become nothing. And boy, doesn't that sound like strange words to the world. That's not what the world says. So I wrote down a few things that we need to hang on to as we're growing, and then we'll get to 1 Timothy. I wrote down a few things. Number one, God knows best. God knows best. He knows better than you do. His plans are better than your plans and better than my plans. I heard someone say once, if you had a million years to make a plan for your life, well, let's make it a billion years. Why not a trillion years? And you made a plan for your life, and you set it next to God's plan, who would have the better plan? So why do we make so many plans? I mean, intellectually, I know that. And yet I still have my hopes and my dreams and my wishes and my desires since I was a little kid of what I want and what I think and how I want everything to be. And I want everybody to listen to me all the time and follow my ways. And Jesus said, no, you're not God. Take the crown off. Do you know what I mean? I mean, that's what I struggle with. I'm not preaching just to you here. I'm preaching to myself. And because we're no different. But number one, God knows best. Number two, self is not our friend. Your flesh, not your friend. Number three, I wrote down submission can bring freedom. And I didn't put will bring freedom, I put can bring freedom because it depends on who you submit to. There are people in this world that want you to submit to them. That doesn't bring freedom, but if you choose to submit to the true and living God, that's the only place you'll ever find freedom. You know, submission is like a dirty word in the world we live in today. Submission, surrender, right? Those are dirty words. Servanthood, ugh. But Jesus designed us to submit, right? Jesus said, nevertheless, not my will be done, but yours. I want a t-shirt this year made that says, not mine, but thine. This, and that's going to be our theme this year for my classroom. Not mine, but thine. Because it really is, that's, really some, that's a summary of the struggle we have in this world. And it's so foolish. Jesus offers us everything. And we hang on to all the weird stuff, the, the sinful stuff. I don't know. It's crazy. Submission can bring freedom. Another one I wrote down is true treasure is not physical. Last year our theme was the permanent is my priority. It just kind of came through and I had a t-shirt made of it because we just kept talking about it all year. And it was some, just such a simple way for me to gauge whether or not I should really be focused on X, Y, or Z. So if in my ranking of priorities I've got something that's not permanent at the top, it shouldn't be there. The permanent, the souls around me should be a priority and the God who lasts forever, and his word that endures forever, that should be my priority. I mean, that's what it says in scripture, right? 
Then I wrote down, uh, Jesus will always, or Jesus said, we will always be servants. And if you think about it, there's the verse, and we may not get to it today, but Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. He's either going to love the one and hate the other, or hate the one and serve the other. You're never going to have more than one master. He never said we get to be masters. When I was a kid, there was a show called He-Man. And I, I loved it. I was not a Christian growing up. Man, I look at the shows I used to watch as a kid, and I think, I wonder why I had deluded ideas in my head. Dungeons and Dragons, I loved that cartoon. And I loved, you know, He-Man and these weird... And, and you know, He-Man became the master of the universe, right? The power was his. And, oh, my goodness, as a kid, oh, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah, yeah. Yep, and, you know, that is the world of darkness that, as a kid, I just didn't know any better. But then now that I know better, I shouldn't try to still function in that world, and yet I do. So I need to get back to his word. The last one that I wrote down here was, um, we will always have masters, and we will never be one. And then also, um, this was one I added when I was thinking about it, was you will be content, you will be the most content when you're doing what you're designed to do. Rick Warren, he's got a lot of issues. But, you know, he talked about the whole purpose-driven thing. And the purpose-driven thing actually is a very self-centered thing. What is my purpose in life? What, what do you, God, what do you have for me to do? Well, but generally speaking, it's a fair thing to say. Our, pur sorry. Our purpose isn't to serve ourselves, but to love the Lord and to know him and to serve him. And if you can just get a hold of that much. I had a kid one time in eighth grade, and he said, Mr. Hughesby, what our school at that time only went up through eighth grade. It was a different school. It was in, in Green, uh, Appleton, Wisconsin. And he said, Mr. Hughesby, I'm going to be done with this school. What do you think God wants me to do? I said, I think he wants you to worship him. I, I, didn't, I said, I don't know what he wants specifically from you, but if you're not worshiping him, you're never going to know. So you might as well start now thinking about what it means to worship God in spirit and truth. And it is really that simple. Well, turn with me to 1 Timothy, because we do have a few minutes, and I want to get through 1 Timothy chapter 6. With all of that said... I think it'll help kind of direct our steps as we go through this section. And I'm going to start in verse 1. I know, I think Pastor Danny read 1 and 2, I think, last time perhaps. But I'm going to, I think they tie in perfectly with the rest of the chapter. So 1 Timothy, a few more books over. And this is what it says. I'm just going to read a little bit and then share a little bit and then read a little bit. Verse 1, it says, Let as many servants... There we go with that servant's theme again. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor. That the name of God in his doctrine, hang on to that word, be not blasphemed. 1 Timothy 6.2 says this, And they that have believing masters, let them not despise them, because they are brethren but rather do them service because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. And that word exhort means strongly encourage. Now at first when I read through this chapter, I was thinking, mm, this section seems to tie in better with last chapter. And I was tempted just to start in verse 3, but as I was reading it over and over, it occurred to me this is really important for the thrust of the rest of the chapter. The heart of a servant is where everything starts to make a whole lot of sense in the world. You get to take off your hands from the wheel. You get to take off the control as a servant. You have a master in heaven that loves you dearly, will never lead you wrong. You don't have to take control of everything, right? So the servant's heart, I think, is where the rest of this goes. Now, we already talked about um, one of the keys that I tied in here was a servant's heart. We talked about Jesus saying there are you can't you can't have two masters you're going to either you know you're going to serve one or you're going to serve the other, so that was the first key. The second key has to do with godliness. So let's read a little further in First Timothy chapter six, verse three. It says, "If any man teach otherwise, you notice there's a lot of teaching going on here, and the, and I know it's written to Timothy. He's a pastor, and so we get this idea that Paul is trying to encourage Timothy to be a good pastor." But there's more than that going on here. It's reminding us that if we truly want to be free, we need good teaching. There is a direct link between servanthood, godliness, and doctrine. 
And we're going to talk about that link as kind of the goal to get to here. Verse 3, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's why he read that. Wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine, my Bible says, to the doctrine which is according to godliness. Interesting word, godliness. Do you know it's only used in a couple different places in the Bible? It's used nine times in 1 Timothy, this word godliness. It's used a total of 11 times that I could find in 1, 2 Timothy, and Titus. And it's also used four times in 1 Peter, or 2 Peter. And those are the only places it's used. In all of Scripture, in the New Testament, the word godliness. Now, I didn't look up godly, but I did look up godliness. And it's used nine times in this, cha in this book. 1 Timothy. Interesting, you know how many times doctrine is used? And I don't think it's like a, a funny number thing, but nine times. I thought, well, that's interesting. Seventeen times the word doctrine is used in First and Second Timothy and Titus. I do think there is a connection between godliness and the doctrine we hold to. Jesus said, sanctify them by your word, your word is truth. If you want to grow in godliness, God-likeness, because of the Holy Spirit in you, you have to grow in sound doctrine, which means you have to teach from this book, right? You have to read from this book. You can't just be fed on Sunday mornings. You have to take this thing home. I don't know about you, but I already ate this morning a little bit. We were, I was hungry on the way down. I told Sarah, we've got to stop. I've got to get something in my stomach, right? I eat daily, a few times a day at least along with some snacks that I probably shouldn't have. But God's word, how much more so should I be feasting daily on God's word? That's where the power is really at. This idea of godliness. So let me look at, let's look a little bit further then. So it says, I'm going to start back up, um, start, I'm going to start at verse 3 again. If any man teaches otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words and even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. That implies there's doctrines according to ungodliness, by the way. If you choose to not hold on to those things, verse 4 says, you are proud. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof comes envy, strifes, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain, earthly gain, is godliness. From such, withdraw yourselves. Now, there is a distinct correlation or opposition here that Paul is drawing out. He says, those that choose not to hold the sound doctrine will connect gain with godliness. Now, we all know that there are churches that teach gain for godliness. The Word Faith Movement, the New Apostolic Reformation movements, there are a lot of movements that teach that the, you can actually get God to give you more money and keep you healthy and wealthy and all that fun stuff. God becomes a genie. He becomes the, you know, the vending machine and you just need to know the right words. That's New Age mysticism, by the way. Christianity sure didn't invent that. They just adopted it because they didn't want sound doctrine, so they went to another form of godliness, earthly godliness. And we're surrounded with it. Turn on the radio, you can read a book, plenty of books on it. Listen to podcasts, you can search them all out. You go to other countries, you hear it all over the place in India and, and Africa, all these places that are super poor, but boy, God sure wants you rich. And even books like Purpose Driven Life had to be rewritten a little bit to go to other countries because it didn't make as much sense to have this giant purpose when you're basically scraping by trying to survive day by day with a bowl of rice. But godliness doesn't have to do with earthly gain. And yet when I was a kid, obviously I want to get as much as I can, so sometimes I'm like, God, I just want a little bit more. Come on, let me go a little easier. But I'm thinking, you know when I usually trust the Lord? When I'm struggling. And so much of our country says, let's just avoid the struggle, take a pill, whatever, and, you know, and make things easier in my life. And I'm not wishing hardness on, or, you know, hard times on anybody, but I will tell you it's the hard times I really learned to get on my knees. It's the hard times that bring me to my knees. So I don't wish them on anybody, but I don't wish them away from people either. Often in scripture, you'll find Paul talking about the sufferings that produce the fruit. Often it's there, and yet we don't want it. 
I feel like it's the Laodicean church all over, right? The church that says, that says themselves they are rich and in need of nothing. You could kind of say they are rich and in need of no God. I don't want to be that way, personally. So I have to check myself. So we've got this idea that gain is godliness from such withdraw yourselves because it becomes an infection. It becomes tempting. But look at the next verse, verse 6. But here's the opposite of that, the counterbalance to that. Paul just switches godliness and gain. So instead of gain being godliness, he says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. You see, there's the heavenly economy. There's the kingdom of lights promised to you that if you want gain, you need to go the godly way. And then you'll realize the gain isn't physical. The gain is spiritual. The gain is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's the gain. Can't go on Amazon and buy it. Can't do it. Can't go to the pawn store and find godliness. So you've got this idea of godliness growing us. Turn with me to 2 Timothy, a little bit over. We've got about 15 minutes. I want to go through this and just hopefully tie these things together. This idea of gaining and what the goal of the gaining is and the danger, the danger of false godliness. 2 Timothy chapter 3, and I'm just going to read while you're turning there just for time, so I apologize. But 2 Timothy chapter 3 says, know, uh, This know also that in the last days, the days probably that we are in, the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient. Doesn't sound like much godliness going on. Disobedient to parents, unthankful. There's that unthankful. Unholy, without natural affections, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, means selfish, high-minded, lovers of pleasure. There you go. More than lovers of God. You want to talk about art? That sum summarizes, especially that last little section there. Lovers of pleasure. You don't think we have any false gods? I think our greatest false god in this country is pleasure. Call it what you want. Convenience, comfort, power, it's pleasure. This generation growing up right now <clears throat> is not a technological generation, but it is a generation being trained to love entertainment. But what they're really being trained to do by going on their phones and scrolling and everything else isn't entertainment, it's pleasure. Why do people keep getting addicted to gambling? The pleasure of it. It's the endorphins. It's the rush of it. Pornography. The pleasure of it. It's no different for kids going on. It's a drug. And it's the pleasure they're getting. It's a lover of pleasure rather than the lovers of God. That's what we're being trained up in, just so you understand what's going on in this dark world. Lovers of God, and it says, having a form of godliness, but denying what? The power thereof. Do you see it's empty from the world? The world says, hey, you, you can have all this stuff. And they, their form of godliness is you can be godly by trusting in yourself. You can be your own God. That sounds familiar. And Jesus said, I'm sorry, the job's already filled. I'm God. You were created to serve me. Not because he needs you, by the way. He's not some selfish God up there in heaven going, I need some people to serve. I need some people to love me, so I think I'll just create people, and then they can love me, and I'll be like a marionette pulling the strings. That, that's how the world sees God, like a despot, like some egomaniac up in heaven that just needs people to love him. No. What is love? Love is selfless. He created people so that he could give his love away. He wanted to share the best. He has nothing that he needs from us. He was fully self-sufficient. Wasn't he? Isn't he? I mean, that's what the Trinity is all about. God the Father perfectly loves God the Son, and God the Son perfectly loves God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit perfectly loves the Father and the Son. They perfectly love. He perfectly loves. For eternity past, he doesn't need us to love him, but he sure wants us to because we get blessed. That's the truth. And when we learn to serve him and follow him, we can enjoy his love. And Satan doesn't want that. Now, for time, I'm going to actually skip through. I did have 2 Peter chapter 1, but I'm going to go ahead and go to the next one. Um, key, the key three I had was um, eternal perspective. And just this idea, and it ties in with godliness. So if you want to turn there with me, 2 Peter. So a few more books over. And again, that, that idea of doctrine and godliness, they show up a lot in 1st, 2nd, and 
First, Second Timothy, and also in Titus. And this idea of godliness shows up in Second Peter. And I wanted to read just this one, because you know. We're born in a planet that says, I want to get as much as I can and stay here as long as I can and dig my roots down deep as I can. But that's not what scripture says. The scripture says we're just passing through. We're pilgrims and strangers and foreigners. And Peter says it well here in chapter 3. I'm going to start, I think, in around verse 10. It says this, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away. This is talking about the end of time when God actually lets go of the universe. With a great noise and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. So even if you can gain the world, Jesus said, what would have gained someone? What would have benefit someone to gain the whole world and forfeit their soul? You could gain it all. You could gain full control of the planet and actually somehow figure out how to get everybody to follow you and in the end it wouldn't matter. Right? It wouldn't matter. It'll all be burned up. That's the true perspective. In verse 11 it says, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, all the things you're working so hard to gain, the house, the car, the technology, the gaming systems, whatever it is, right? We're all people. We all try to gain it. I'm no different. All the things my flesh craves, it's all going to be burned. The permanent should be our priority. And that's part of the system we should be seeking. It says here in verse 11, Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we be in all holy conversation or conduct and godliness? Wow, there's freedom in that. I don't, I don't have to control anything. The Lord's, it's all going to go away anyway. So that was key three. Key three was eternal perspective. And then I put in key four, eternal treasure. And we're not going to turn there, but Jesus talked about this in Luke. And he talked about the man who just thought he, he was so rich, right? And he gathered so much stuff. He says, ah, I'm going to build another barn to gather all my stuff. And it was all me. If you look at that section, it's all me, my, my. In Luke chapter 12. And Jesus said, you fool. Tonight your soul is required of you. And he was trying to point out again this eternal idea that treasures and stuff we gather. And for some of us, maybe it's not the stuff. Maybe it's the, the friends. I know for kids it's hard. You know, I don't have as many friends as I want. So you try to gather friends and relationships or whatever. These days it's likes. I need as many likes as I possibly can get. And it sounds silly, doesn't it? But for kids and for some grown-ups, man, that's, that's a driving force. If I, don't, if I get abused or bullied online from my kid, that, that means a lot to me. Because then I lose my likes and I lose that connection of who I really am, at least who I think I am. And that's, that all that stuff doesn't matter. It really doesn't. So the last thing I wanted to, that we'll have time to talk about is this, this idea of contentment. It didn't just say godliness is great gain. It says godliness, godliness with what? Contentment. And this is a whole other talk that we could talk about for a whole other hour. So if I reset this thing, that means I have another 45 minutes, right? But contentment. This idea, I think, is the biggest thing I struggle with these days, personally. Not so much, I mean, patience, everybody always says, I don't want to pray for patience, because then God gives me all these things to like, teach me how to be patient. But I think the world really wants a discontented soul. Because when we're discontented, we run around and seek for contentment. And so that's why it says, godliness with contentment is great gain. Th that word contentment is used only twice in the scriptures. Once here... The other time is 2 Corinthians 9, verse 8, and it's dealing with earthly contentment. God will provide. And the word it uses, at least in the King James, is sufficiency. And I don't know if you've ever thought about that word, sufficiency, but it's a really important word as a Christian. If God isn't sufficient for you, guess where you're going to go? Anywhere else. See, sufficiency means when you say that God's word is true, that's fine. But there are plenty of people that say God's word is true. It's just not sufficient. So I can go other places and get other truth. There's a huge danger in that because then I'm taking the world's ideas and squishing them into this book that's already sufficient. If I think that my spouse is sufficient, guess what I'm never going to do? Sleep around. Because he or she, if you're a girl, of course, and for me it'd be a she, making that clear, uh, that would, my wife was sufficient for me. Now, did she meet every one of my needs? No, because that's not her job. That's God's job. Her job isn't to meet all my needs. That's a worldly idea, by the way. 
My wife isn't there to meet my needs. What are my needs? Well, usually for us as selfish creatures, most of our needs are really wants anyway. And it goes back to that thing as a child, what I thought I needed as a child and what I wanted life to be like. And then I grow up and have this weird figment of my imagination that I'm trying to apply to this entire universe. And it doesn't work. And then I get mad at God because my ideas don't work. But my spouse wasn't there to meet my needs. God is. And most of the time, I need to meet my needs to really allow God to meet my needs. I need to. I need to get out of my knees and humble myself is typically the issue. But this idea of sufficiency, if God's word is true but not sufficient, then you're leaving the door wide open. There are a lot of people that will say that creation is the 67th book of the Bible. That's a dangerous idea. What they're saying is that you can look at the world around you and use evolution and philosophical ideas to apply to the Bible and then reinterpret the scriptures. Creation isn't the 67th book of the Bible. It's just not. God's word is sufficient. Now, if it's sufficient, and that's what Peter says, right? Peter says that, and we're not going to have time to turn there, but it says, all things are given to us. Scripture is sufficient for all things according to life and godliness. And there's a really important reason. That's, that's a sufficiency verse from Scripture. Because once you have God as your sufficiency, you have contentment. That's where contentment comes. When we somehow think that God plus something else. Now, I would teach the kids nouns, and usually we'll start at the beginning of the year. Nouns are people, places, and things. And then by the middle of the year, I think they've got it, and they don't. And I'll say, okay, what's a noun? And they'll say, run. And I'll say, no, 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 that's a verb. Well, then what's a noun? It's people, places, and, oh, yeah, people, places, and things. And then we talk about how ideas can be nouns. And then by the end of the year, I think they've got it. And then, you know, I'm like, you guys are fourth and fifth graders. Come on, nouns. They need nouns. And then they're all, they have amnesia by the end of the year because, you know, they're done. People, places, and things. But if you can think of it that way, when you run after people and you run after places and you run after things and you run after ideas for contentment, you'll never find it. What typically happens is the things you run after for contentment will be your masters. That's how the world really works. Now the world doesn't want you to know that because they want you running after all of their stuff because then you'll serve them and give them more money and they'll have power, right, and control. And we think we're finding freedom in all that stuff and running after those people and those places and those things. I mean, that's what, right, Daniel even said at the end of time it'll be like people running to and fro around the earth. And I, that's talking about technology, but I kind of think that's also talking a little bit about discontentment. People running around, well, I gotta, I gotta get filled somewhere. And then you go to something. We all know this, right? You go to something, and you're like, yes, oh, I found some satisfaction in that thing. And then after a while, it doesn't satisfy. So what do you do? Go somewhere else. Find another thing to satisfy you. I'm no different. Then I go, Lord, what am I doing? I just need to look up. And that's where it's at. And so this idea of contentment is is central to the idea of godliness. It's central to the idea of godliness. The idea of having a servant's heart is central in finding godliness. Contentment is central in keeping godliness and growing in godliness. So I wrote some things down, and this is kind of where we'll wrap up. I told you I wasn't going to get all the way through it. But we might want to read just a little bit further. We'll see if there's time. But I wrote these little bullet points down, and they're kind of like bumper sticker bullet points. And I can send them to Pastor Danny. They're nothing, nothing amazing, but it's just kind of fun to kind of summarize things. One of the things I wrote down was sufficiency and contentment. If Jesus and his word are sufficient, true contentment will come. And that's what we just talked about. The other thing I wrote down is trust in the Lord is essential. You have to trust him. And this dumb thing came to mind last night. I didn't even know if I wanted to say it, but I'll say it. And it rhymes. That's why it came to mind. But I think it fits. I'll premise it this way. When I looked up the word contentment, it actually means, it has this idea of being restrained. Contentment comes when you are being formed and controlled, in a sense, to be in a self-controlled environment. So I, it, the definition talks about being restrained, being held together, or being contained. Now, for us, that feels like discontentment, like I'm being controlled and held together. But no, it means being held together properly. In other words, I've often heard it said doctrine, teaching, is like the container that holds the truth. And when you have good doctrine, it's what, can, it's, it's what holds you together. And when you have good doctrine, that's like, 
this idea of being content in God's word, sufficient in the doctrine, sufficient and content in his word, being held together. And what's interesting, and when we read first in Colossians, you know it says in Colossians chapter 1 there that Jesus holds the universe together by his word. So contentment means being held together and trusting in God's word to be sufficient, and then contentment comes. And when you're content, you don't go other places, which keeps you safe and growing in Christ. So I wrote this down. I just said, trust is the crust. And I thought, that's a dumb thing to say. But then I was, I was thinking about it, and I was thinking, it actually is kind of true. Because when you have a pie, which is filled with fruit, see the biblical analogy there, filled with fruit, you need the crust. If you don't have the crust, it's worthless. My mom loved the crust. You know, she, she went home to be with the Lord a while back, but she would always pick off pieces of the crust, and if it was a good buttery crust, oh, she would love it. But the idea of that crust holding everything together, I thought, that actually fits. Because without that trust, without that contentment, the fruit doesn't get held together. Things don't make sense. And I think often as a Christian, that's where the struggle comes. I also wrote this down, disconnected equals discontented. Disconnected equals discontented. If you're disconnected from the Word and the Word and the family of Christ, you can't have contentment. It just, just won't happen. Another one was not mine but thine. We talked about that. And I also wrote down this, covetousness competes with contentment. And that's all of this we could talk so much more about, but covetousness competes with contentment. Um, Patience and thanksgiving often follow it. We're not going to talk too much about that right now, but if you think about it, being patient will produce also that, that godliness. And the last thing I think I'll point out of these little bullet points is this, and then we'll end with the scripture. The, you know, we're often taught that if you listen, talk to a rich person, I know it's been said, if you're really rich and you ask them how much money is enough, they'll always say a little bit more. In other words, money doesn't really bring you happiness. It might bring a few conveniences along the way. But money will never satisfy. And there's this idea that, well, wanting more is a bad thing. And I almost, I take it a little bit differently, and I might change my mind someday on this, so feel free to correct me, but I almost think it's just the wrong direction. I think God actually created us to want more problem is we point it toward the earth instead of him. I think he wants us to want more and more of him. And the more that you're satisfied and content in Christ, the more you're going to want him. It's just the way it is. The problem is we point our hearts this direction and we just can't get enough. Just can't fill that longing and that hole in our hearts because we're just going the wrong direction. And when we're filled with Christ, we want more. I want more of him and less of me. I just That's how it is. So don't point your heart to the world. Point it to the Word. Let's turn here, and we'll wrap up with this. And so I'll give you an opportunity to teach through the rest of uh, 1 Timothy chapter 6. But if, as you're going through the rest of 1 Timothy chapter 6, you will see that a lot of this ties in with what we're talking about. But um, turn with me to Philippians, and we'll wrap up with this. Philippians chapter 3. The, the message, the, the title of today's message, really was the greatest gain. And then I added a subtitle to it, in order to have the greatest gain, you need to have the greatest loss. And who had the greatest loss was Christ. He died on that cross. And that's actually one of the verses we were going to read, talking about the mystery of godliness is really Christ. And then we have that mystery because the Holy Spirit's now living inside of us to produce godliness. And we know that godliness with contentment is great gain. So the greatest gain you'll ever have. And here it is. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. Paul says this. Well, the Lord through Paul. But what things were gained to me, those I count loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them dung. That actually means animal dung, by the way that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Verse 10 says, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, 
and be made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might obtain the resurrection of the dead. Not as though I have already attained, either were already made perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend that which I am also apprehended of Christ Jesus. Verse 13, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. You want the highest gain? It's Christ. It's knowing him more and more and more until he calls you home and you get to see him face to face. And the only way to have that gain is to have the loss. So there's that song, you know, so long self, and I think that's kind of where it's at. Take up the cross and follow him and let his word be your sufficiency. Amen? Amen. Amen. And godliness with contentment truly is the gain we need. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for reminding us from your word that we are here to serve and not just serve but to serve you and to love you and to follow you Lord help us to take the crown off and give it back to you help us be content in the truth Lord you are our supply and you are sufficient for everything we need we love you thank you for loving us first in Jesus name we all can say amen amen, amen.